everyone. Welcome to the second quarantine studio visit in our series. Um, we are going to meet John Michael Bird today. John Michael is a New York City artist. He is from Franklinton, Louisiana. John and Michael grew, and I grew up together in Franklinton, so we've known each other for quite a long time. Um, John Michael got his BFA at Louisiana State University and his MFA at um, the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And I'd love you to meet John Michael. Hi, John. Hi. We have known each other for quite a long time. I think mm -hmm. since I was in third grade. Yeah, And Something like I've that. seen your work um, change in a variety of ways. Uh, can you kind of talk about how your process has changed over the years and, and how you've come to what you do now? Process-wise, it, it really depends on, like, my work is really a lot about myself. Um, I always talk about that I'm a painting-based artist, but that everything that I'm doing is sort of, I'm the filter uh, for, like, what's going on in my life. So it kind of inevitably kind of rolls into my work. So my grandmother is a, is a painter, and she's a portrait artist, kind of regionally known in Louisiana. And so I was always really interested in like the figure and dealing with the body and things like that. And, um, but I always wanted to sort of uh, separate myself away from like that lineage a little bit um, to sort of stand out. So I was kind of started out doing figurative work, uh, but it was much more like psychological portraiture. What I, what I think people would think that they would look like themselves and not necessarily what they actually look like. Um, and I sort of did that for a while. And then once I went to graduate school, I really started getting more interested in um, the body and sort of like an inside outside kind of way of like uh, what it would look like if you like poked the body and it ruptured and all the insides came out and, and thinking a lot more about um, the psychological coming out and then the viewer going into the body, if that makes any sense. So you'll, a lot of my work is um, dealing with uh, transparency and that sort of like layering of one world over the other. Um, and then also my sort of like side spiritual practice sort of works in that way to sort of deal with the work I'm doing now. And then the work now is a lot of dream interpretations or um, things that I see on the street, like being in New York, you always see lots of crazy things like in the trash and you see juxtapositions of like weird objects or like riding next to some weird thing on the, on the train. You, you, you start making these like weird connections. So I sort of laid those works on top of the, those ideas on top of one another. Um, so I guess it's kind of gone from like literal, like what things look like to inside outside to now being more like imagined scapes and imagined objects and um, things that are sort of stand-ins more for portraits, I guess. Yeah, and speaking of transparency, you actually paint on transparent materials. Can you kind of show us around your studio? Oh, sure. Can you show us what you're working on right now? Right, so, um, so these are sort of finished paintings here, but this material, like all of this is, transparent mylar and then the the actual painting like this area is opaque and then this is transparent so like if I stick my hand under it my hand is behind it so anywhere that's like a white for the most part for a painting is the background of the wall and then they're sort of floated off the wall um, like this alligator is a good example of like this is the wall and clear and then this is paint and image but you can really see them in, like I started some of these the other day. So these are like when I first start on them, they're completely transparent. So I can really put my hand on, you can sort of see. So there's like a skeleton um, that the work is on. So I start um, with a piece of mylar on my table, which well, maybe I can, the table, <laughs> and I work flat and then working I, I miss the the surface and kind of create a surface tension of water like a sheen of water over the top of the image and then draw and paint the image on top so i'm sort of like fighting the material all, all my artist friends are like are you trying to make it difficult for yourself because there's a lot of like pushing and pulling that has to happen the water eventually evaporates out of 
the image and the image slowly settles on top of the mylar. And then eventually I have to like affix the image and then I flip it over and paint back paint. So all the color is on the opposite side of the painting. Um, so you can like touch all over it and it's not going anywhere. And, I, and in, oh, that process sort of comes from um, the history and uh, of like old school animation because the material I'm actually painting on is what they would use for like an animation style. It's just on a larger scale. Uh, and then and that also goes kind of back to that idea of like laying over images. So when you're making an animation, there's like a drawing and then you overlay the color on top. And I always like that idea of like, there's these two worlds and then there's one world you are simultaneously happening on like a sheet of paper. So like this world is on this side and this world is on that side. So that's kind of where the layering kind of comes from. It's really interesting to see your work, especially over the years and knowing you personally. And, you know, I, I know you well enough to know that you're kind of a big goofball. Yep. And you have a yep. great sense of humor, and we always laugh a lot when we talk. Um, and I, I see that in your work, the sense of humor, the colorfulness, but there's always this darker edge. Um, mm -hmm. In right. some ways, I think the, your imagery is like dissolving our, that sinking sense on these transparent ones where, I, mm -hmm. where the ev water evaporates and pulls at, especially your figures. Yeah, they start yeah. to get um, kind of dark. What do you think about, how do you marry those two things? Like this um, inquisitiveness, this silliness that you have and this other sort of dark um, yeah. force, how do those interact? Well, I find it really interesting because, like, for years, I really fought the the comical bit of my work. Like, it was it's always been there, but it's sometimes it was like way under the surface, and I'm like tamping it down. Like, no, 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 because you need to be like serious art. It can't be funny. It can't. It has to be uh, taken for what it is. As like, uh, if you're if you're if you're if you're cracking a joke, you're you're not doing anything important where I sort of think, well, life is really absurd anyway. There's that saying about like, you can be a, the, the clown can say the most uh, cutting thing and cut closest to the bone or to the truth because they're saying it in like a comical way. And there's like this history of satire. So in a lot of ways, I'm kind of just like playing into that, that sort of history of satirical ribbing. And you can get away with saying a lot if you're being funny or if it looks at first glance uh, fluffy or um, childlike. Like I was telling a friend the other day, really in my work, what I'm doing is sort of rectifying um, childhood with who I am now and like trying to like meet those points in the middle. And that, that, that point is like that, this work that I'm making. I'm always really jealous of people that are like, oh, my child was so great, don't have any trauma. And I'm like, oh, who are you? What planet are you? But for the rest of us, even though my family's great, but like, you know, it's complicated if you, like I always say I'm from the planet, planet Romulac, like I don't know how I was born where I was born, like in a lot of ways, like I don't. So it's like that feeling of um, feeling out of place. It's just one of those things where it's like, it, I think it just naturally happens in the work that there's this like tension point. I don't ever really know how to refer to it other than that, of like the, the dark and the, the whimsical you know, and for a long time, I was always really afraid of like people saying, well, this is really like illustrative. And I was like, oh, no, I'm not illustrative. La, la, la. And now I'm like, that's cool. I think it comes with age, like the longer I've been doing it, because I've been at it for a while now. You just kind of get comfortable with that bit of yourself. But I do think that that's where that, like, that, that, that darkness comes from, because, you know, life is kind of that duality of everything, of being totally ridiculous. I mean, we're doing a Skype interview because we're all quarantined. I mean, come on now. That's ridiculous yeah um you know thinking about um when we first met i believe i was probably in third grade and you were mm -hmm. in fifth grade mm -hmm. and there weren't artists where we no. lived. like there mm -hmm. wasn't an option for what you could be or what you could do and yet both of us were doing art we were making art um from a very early age and taking art classes together Mm -hmm. And um, your work now makes the most sense to me with that dark edge of how, you know, you grow up in, a, in an area where your vision isn't represented. 
Um, mm -hmm. Not because people are necessarily against it, but just because there's not a variety of people around. There's just no representation. Representation is everything. And if you don't, there was not really a model for me to be like, yeah. I'm going to be an artist. Like, I, I mean, I was probably way into almost my 20s before I'm like, hey, I could actually do this for a living. There was this idea that that was for other people. Like maybe, maybe in another place and time that somebody could do that. But the idea that like, or like historically you could do it, but like in real modern time, you didn't do that. Just, it, it, like I always tell people like now that I'm in New York, it's like to me, it's a miracle that I'm here because I, sometimes when I talk even with people now, I might as well live on the surface of the moon. Going back to your artwork, talk a little bit about you said a lot of imagery are stand-ins for other things. Um, mm -hmm. Your sense of humor and that sort of dark edge are ways of making certain types of statements. Can you talk about what type of statements you're trying to make with your work? Right now, I'm really pulling a lot from like images from my childhood, just because like I, I have kind of a, like a large meditative practice. This is like a side note to my artwork and my teaching and everything else I'm doing. A lot of times when you're meditating, you know, you're trying to train, you're training your brain to like not affix to what you're like seeing, you know, it's just like crazy crap happening in your brain. However, like as an artist, sometimes the greatest things you see are like, oh my God, I need to remember that. It's like when you, when you have a dream and you want, if you don't write it down right when you wake up, you'll never remember it. So I'm forever like, I can't talk right now when I get up in the morning, I have to write this down. A lot of what I'm doing is like interpreting like certain images together and just seeing how they symbolically sort of talk to each other. And sometimes I don't actually know what the meanings are until like sometime after making them. Like a lot of times I'll just think like, I really want to make a painting of like, I don't know, a birthday cake. And then like, so in my brain, I'm always thinking like, well, well I want to make a birthday cake, but I, it, that's boring. It can't just be a birthday cake. Somebody's done that before. So I'm always trying to think like, well, what, what would be like a, an interesting thing to go with the birthday cake that would tell like some kind of narrative. So like this alligator is on a birthday cake. And for me, like a lot of these images are coming from like celebratory objects. So birthday cake. So there's like a, the deviled egg thing, which if you're from the South, everybody had one of those in their house. And deviled eggs were like a like fancy thing. I can't do, I'm holding a computer, but fancy. Um, but they're sort of like rites of passages. And I'm kind of interested in those, those kind of objects that can sort of stand in for that, that aren't necessarily like the trope objects. So like a good example would be like a wedding dress would be like a trope of a wedding, but I'm more interested in something else that would stand in for it. So it could be, I don't know, like a chair, some kind of chair that would be at a formal hall or something like that. Or like I, I had some paintings of like, um, like church pews would stand in for like family because in the South, family, that's what you do. You go to church. I was actually going to ask you specifically about the deviled eggs because um, that is such a ubiquitous Southern image. Mm -hmm. um, those were always at any church gathering, the devil right. eggs were made and multiple kind, different people had better ones and the devil eggs and the dumplings. Yeah. Yep, um, those yep. are the two major dishes. And so when I see that it's, it, well, it's also going back to your play on words because it was a, it was a staple at church, but they're deviled eggs. They're, they're, the yep, 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 um, yep, yep. And so that, I, I really resonates with me seeing that dish. It is much more than just an egg. It's it's a uh, culture. That's that's right. the southern culture there. Well, I think I think being from the south, I always call it it's an operatic culture where like everything is so dramatic. Even when they're not trying to be dramatic, it's dramatic. And I say this as a full blown dramatic person. Like I use the phrase all the time. Like anytime I talk to anybody from home. It's never just like a story. It's always like just over the top enough where you're like, really girl, did that really happen? Like I always call it, they died driving the boat mobile. It's always like, you remember old lady, fill in the blank. And you're like, uh-huh, what happened? She died. I'm like, okay, well, what happened to her? And like, 
it's never just like not a natural it's always like the school bus ran over and the dogs like all of us were driving the school bus it's always something crazy and i find that that sense of absurdity i'm really interested in and and i guess that kind of plays into that like dark macabre-ness it's like the emperor's new clothes it's like am i the only one realizing that this is totally ridiculous because they're always telling it to me in a totally serious way and then i start laughing it's not funny but it's so ridiculous that I can't help but yeah. kind of laugh at it. Even even stories of where the death was totally natural or normal, um, it mm -hmm. would be, did you know so-and-so? And like, yeah, mm -hmm. she died. And you're like, oh, that's horrible. Of what? Of, you know, cancer. You know, she cheated on her husband, though. And oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My dad <laughs> says this one. He'll say, you remember old lady Hillover? Who are, you know, and I'll go, oh, yeah. What What's going on with her? She woke up dead. That's my favorite. She woke up dead. I laugh so hard. Again, turn a phrase. It's like, we're all good storytellers because there has, you have to keep your, like, audience. Like, I have really struggled to think of people that aren't good at telling a story. Even if they're, like, the d dullest person, they can tell a story because it's, like, it's the way of communicating. You know, even with this, I can't not have my hands going like crazy because like, you get really excited like, going, oh and then guess who she cheated on her husband you know it, it's hard to be like steeped in that tea <laughs> and not like be a little warped by it a little bit i think you know and that's not like saying this is bad i never realized how southern i was until i didn't live in the south anymore and then literally every person i talked to was like god you're southern and i'm like really because i just you know i don't i don't necessarily think of myself that way but I think that like all that kind of plays into the image selection that I make and the juxtapositions that I make and even titling of things sometimes or even representing it because I think that there's this sort of weird lying um, turkey that happens in Southern culture where like there may be some kitschy visual cues that someone some somewhere else may not pick up on where like we might like grist mills on like stumps in people's houses and they're like and i love that stuff i think it's so bad but i i like it in like a campy way but like it's totally treated with like this reverence that i i really enjoy and like i i really like like any kind of religious art of any type that is sort of presented in like this really holy way but it's all like a word and like not the best in the world i like i love it I don't know, it just like always like plays into those like threads that are like going swirling around my brain. I don't think I reference a lot of Southern culture in my own work. I reference a lot of re religious culture, but um, I see the most Southernness in your work all the time. And it's very mm -hmm. interesting how those, um, how those things follow our art making and how it follows our practice for years and years and years. And um, yeah. How we're both still influenced by the, the small town we grew up in. Well, you can't you can't divorce yourself as much as you try from where you're from. You just can't. Like I I tried for years where I'm like I don't want to sound a certain way. I felt a little less than. Now as an adult, I think it's like the greatest thing because it's like all your weaknesses are actually your strengths, and I, I and that's why my work. I, I'm glad to know that you can see that it's very southern because like in the last I don't know two years. I've really tried to like really embrace all that lexicon because I, I feel like it is sort of this like the language that I still like mining and like childhood things and like because for, for me childhood is the south is the church is big family is all these things food that's why I was all these food and like funny funny things in my work because I, I just feel like it, it is that it's always wonderful catching up with you. Thank you so much for sharing your studio with us. Thank you for sharing your work. Um, you guys can check out more about John Michael at his website, johnmichaelbird.com. Keep tuned in for our next quarantine studio visit. Thank you so much for joining us, John Michael. Thank you, Devanna.